Well, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. I hope you're not tired of hearing about it by now, but as I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old and now a new three-month-old, I'm going to be talking about my kids a lot, and especially that of parenting. And being seven and four, my daughter Elizabeth and son Jesse are very much increasingly acutely aware of what is theirs and what is not theirs. Mine is a word we're starting to hear more and more in my house. I can't remember where I thought it, and I'm sure it's not an original thought, but I'll never forget the day years ago when the following truth dawned on me, and maybe it was just the way it dawned on me, the thoughts or the words. We think we have a lot in this life, and certainly we do. We're blessed with far more than what we deserve, but when it comes to what we possess, if it can be taken away from you, you truly don't own it. If it can be taken from you, it's not yours. That would include not only money, stuff, but your health, your mind. If it can be taken from you, it's not truly yours. Which is uncomfortable because that means that, if we're honest, we have nothing. But therein, at least Jesus will teach us today, is the good news. That confession, I have nothing, is the first step to receiving everything that God wants to give us. There's no question about it that Jesus has some tough words for the Jewish religious leadership in our text for today. They were accusing Jesus and his disciples of being unfaithful to God because they didn't wash their hands properly before eating. The Jews had developed a very elaborate system of washing. And no doubt God in his word in the Old Testament has ceremonial rules for washing, but as we look at the words of Jesus today, it becomes clear that that's not what they were talking about. They had invented hundreds of more laws. And Jesus was upset with them because they wrongly thought, but also wrongly taught, that cleanliness on the outside has somehow a relation to your cleanliness on the inside. They wrongly believed and taught that you could become clean in your heart, as long as you maintained the appearance of cleanliness outside of yourself. In response to this, Jesus said, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, this people honors me with their lips, meaning they say all the right things, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Hear and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. What comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and the heart defiles a person. This is one of those times in the biblical account where Jesus uses some words, not only with the Pharisees, but as we'll see, even with this Canaanite woman that probably should make us a little uncomfortable if we're listening carefully. Jesus is undeniably frustrated and increasingly irritated with the Pharisees and scribes, the leaders of Israel, the ones who should have knew better than to say that you can somehow be saved by God because you do enough for Him that you offer him enough of your own righteousness. And they should have known better because God made it clear in his word from the very beginning chapters of the book. If you look back in the Old Testament scriptures, the, the very scriptures that the Pharisees would have had memorized, you get right away, even in Genesis 6, before God sent the floodwaters on the earth, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. This Canaanite woman cried out, Son of David, and the Pharisees would have undoubtedly known who that was. 
And they would have had memorized Psalm 51 also, where David himself writes, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. The prophet Isaiah himself said in Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. Again, you have to ask yourself the question, for these Pharisees and scribes who would have had this word memorized, who would have been so familiar with the Old Testament, who knew it better than anyone else, how do they miss it? How do you hear those passages and then believe and teach that you have to do enough for God? How? Well, the answer is quite simple. What God said is true. Their hearts, our hearts, are wicked. We don't even listen to what we know. We would rather, in our foolishness, try and insist that God treat us according to what we deserve and what we think we have, rather than treat us according to His grace. The hearts of the Jewish leaders had become so turned inward and so turned away from God that they believed not only could they do enough for Him, but that they had to save, or that God had to save them if for no other reason than that they were Jewish, they were Hebrew. God certainly did not have enough love for those other sinful, dirty people, especially not Canaanites. They believed wrongly. What they should have believed is that God loved the whole world and was faithful to Israel, even in their stubbornness, for the sake of all people. Because that's what God told Abraham in the very first covenant that they would have also known very well. God said in Genesis 12, go from your country and your kindred, Abraham, to your father's house, to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. And why would he make him a great nation? To bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, God gave His law and His commandments to Israel not because He wanted them to somehow create a performance schematic to where they could do enough to be saved. No, the law was always given, the Word was always given to reveal our brokenness, to reveal our sinfulness so that the world would see how God deals with sinners, how He deals with those who confess their nothing. And then when the world sees that, they want some of it too. But the leaders of Israel were only offended by Jesus. They were only offended by grace. And so, when it became evident that the descendants of Abraham, the leaders of Israel, who were supposed to know the truth, only were going to reject it, Jesus moves on. Matthew tells us the disciples came to him and said, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Not only is he criticizing the Pharisees there for being blind guides, but it's also a warning to his disciples. Don't stick around those who aren't preaching the truth, who are intentionally convoluting it because if the blind lead the blind, those who follow will fall into the pit too. And Jesus meant what he said, leave them alone. Which is why after this exchange with the Pharisees, Matthew tells us in verse 21 that Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he didn't answer her a word. Jesus not answering her is only the beginning of what makes this text uncomfortable not only uncomfortable for you and me, but undoubtedly for everybody that was there at the time. The fact that this woman came to Jesus at all would have proved very tense and unnerving given the cultural and societal realities of the time. 
Theologian John Bombaro, who's a missionary in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate, and also the associate professor of theology at Luther Seminary in Latvia, I think puts into words better than I can just how tense and how uncomfortable this woman's approaching Jesus would have been. He says, normally Canaanites would not approach an Israelite unless it was to fight. As a Canaanite woman, she occupied land which rightly belonged to the Israelites as part of their inheritance, and so was loathed by the Jews for their idolatry. Born an outsider and idolater, by nature she would have been considered by the Jewish people to be an enemy of the living God, sin personified. This is so much so, the rabbis referred to Canaanites as dogs, unclean animals, filthy, garbage-picking scavengers, and she was desperate. She had no one to help her. Her daughter was severely oppressed by a demon. Everything stacks against her in this moment. Her origin, nature, religion, culture, ethnicity, nationality, and even her female sex would have been considered a disadvantage. For all intents and purposes, she is what it looks like to be dead in trespasses and sins, alone and helpless. She's unable to help even the one she loves most. This mother had nowhere else to turn. There was none to save. Jesus is all she has left. In other words, everything had been taken away from this woman. She realized in no uncertain terms, I have nothing. She'd reached the end of herself and much more. But that's exactly where Jesus wanted her to be. That's exactly what he's going to keep pulling out of her, is to bring her not only to the end of her mortal situation, but to the end of her own heart, and to use her faithfulness to teach his disciples about how the kingdom of God really works. You have to ask yourself, why did Jesus ignore her at first? Why even go so far as repeating the slur that was used by other rabbis and call her a dog? Well, I think to do just that to show his disciples and the rest of the world how these people are treated by those who are supposed to know better, how God's people have failed, even the disciples who didn't understand. So Jesus says when his disciples complain to him to send her away, he says, I've come for the lost sheep of Israel. And on its surface, it may sound like he's agreeing with them. She's not an Israelite. Send her away. But what Jesus is really doing is redefining Israel, actually clarifying who Israel was the whole time. Israel is not those born of Jewish blood. Israel has always been of those like Abraham who believed the Lord and had it counted to them as righteousness. Those who confess they have nothing, that they only have God, His faithfulness, His love. Where did this woman get such great faith? How did she know to call Jesus Lord? How did she know to call him the son of Abra or the son of David, which is a very Jewish title? Well, Mark gives us the answer in chapter 3. At the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. See, the woman had heard about this Jesus. Whether she met him or not really doesn't matter. She, she heard the right things to say. And even if her faith wasn't perfect, even if she didn't understand everything she was saying like the Pharisees claimed to understand, here's one thing she did know, and it's the one thing that mattered. Lord, I have no one else but you. I have nothing else but you. My prayer every day is that that's how I would live my life so I never lose sight of it. And I pray the same for you. It's especially difficult for us here in America to think that we actually have something. But we have nothing on our own. That's the warning that's given to us from Jesus in this passage. It's a warning also given to us from Galatians chapter 6, verse 3, when Paul writes, Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. 
It was Martin Luther who famously said, God makes something from nothing, ex nihilo, just like he made everything from nothing in creation. So if a man thinks he's something, if he hasn't yet realized he's nothing, God can't do anything with him. Or at least it's very difficult. I know in the world that doesn't sound very good. The world's constantly trying to tell you not to be this Canaanite woman. Instead, be the Pharisee. Think a lot of yourself. You should increasingly think more of yourself. You should have a a sky-high self-esteem. But Jesus comes to us and says, No, because I love you, I'm going to remind you, you have nothing. Without me, without Jesus, you are nothing. And for those that have ears to hear, that's wonderful news because we worship a Lord who came to Tyre and Sidon, the most despicable place in the Jewish mind, who walked into that sinful area, just like he walked into our sinful hearts. And the God who makes something from nothing took a cross, took less than nothing. He took death to bring us life. When we come to the Lord, confessing the truth that we know in our hearts, emptying ourselves at his feet, saying, Lord, I have nothing more. And he promises to give us himself, and we will have no one less than Jesus, the Jesus who proved victorious over the grave, the one who promised us the treasures in heaven and proved it with his own resurrection from the dead. Those are the eyes of faith that Jesus says are required to see him in the crumbs, even the crumbs of baptism, little drops of water. But if they come from his table, they're powerful to save. Crumbs in the Lord's Supper, not much of a meal. But as the Canaanite woman confessed, Lord, if it comes from your table, that's enough to save my soul, and it will. We confess our everything in Christ because he is the author and the giver of everything. We confess that we have nothing more, and so we have no one less than Jesus. Amen.